Welcome back, she alligators. We are back in action to talk about the Netflix hit documentary, Bad Vegan. If you haven't watched it, go because there's gonna be a ton of spoilers in this video. But it's also like, it's not a real almost like spoiler based story because like the just as little as you might know about it, like a vegan chick like defrauded her restaurant employees and went on the lam due to this Svengali like fat man that she married who filled her I fill her head with all these ideas and took her money. There you go. I mean, there's really no monster under the bed aside from that. The monster doesn't need to be under the bed. It's out in the open. It's sitting there like a fat piece of shit, which is what her husband was. We're going to break down all of this because the big question is, was she really a victim of this guy or was she an accomplice, a co-conspirator? Is she just as much, that's Cowboy grunting in the background because I'm making a little too much noise. I'm making the money that pays for your expensive kibble. Do you know that? Okay, I love you. Was she a co-conspirator? Is she just as guilty as he, as he is? Or was she the victim of a con man with disastrous consequences in her life? Honestly, the answer is kind of both. With situations like this, when we're conned by someone, whether it's out of money or sex or love, empathy, time, it's hard to know. <laughs> am I a victim or am I responsible for this? You just don't know which end is up. So we're going to tease out all the little details of this. We're going to talk about money management. We're going to talk about how to be less vulnerable to predators like this and the specific set of circumstances in her life very well may be present in your life that led to this absolutely catastrophic implosion of everything she had worked for. It's going to be great. We're also going to talk about why these people need to eat a little bit more meat. Their, their brain doesn't have enough protein and healthy fats for the synapses to fire correctly. I just, I really feel like this, this to me, this whole show was just one long infomercial for the keto diet, in my opinion. So we're going to talk about all of that. But before we get started, you guys... I have such a big announcement. I am so excited. We are going to Italy. You guys have been asking for a Shalligator getaway to Europe for forever. And I've been wanting to do this too. But honestly, we were waiting out the vaccine requirements. I, I'm not vaccinated. You know, I'm not going to take you guys any place where that's required. So we were waiting until restrictions lifted. And finally, me and Trova Trip feel comfortable to plan a trip to Italy. This October 23rd through 30th, we are going to Rome, Florence, Tuscany, Siena. It's going to be a nine day journey full of things like wine tasting, pasta making class, olive oil and cheese tasting. You're going to learn about that. Hikes through Tuscany, seeing all the sights in Rome, an arts walking tour in Florence, a gastro food tour in Rome. It's going to be so incredible. You can come if you're from any country in the world. This is for international shalligators. You don't have to be an American. No vaccine. You also don't need to be a chick. You just have to be a gay man. <laughs> you be a gay woman, but no straight dudes. So this is for girls and gays only. The first 10 signups, you are going to save $200. So go ahead and click the link down below. This trip will sell out. So definitely get your slot locked in early. We've only got 20 spaces. We're really gonna immerse ourselves. And of course, we're gonna travel with a photographer to capture all the wonderful moments. I'm so excited. Okay, let's talk bad vegan. Oh, also, I don't know if it tugs your heartstrings the way it tugged at mine. Anthony, not Fat Anthony, but Anthony, the homeless guy who was friends with Sarma and, and Leon, he just seemed so sweet and so protective. And I actually found him on Instagram while I was watching the show and DM'd him. And I'm like, hey, do you have a GoFundMe set up for yourself? And he's like, no, uh-uh. He does have a cash app. I'm gonna look into setting up a GoFundMe for him. His cash app is right down there and the dollar sign is part of the cash app username. So if you want to like send him a few bucks, tell him thank you. He still is homeless. He still lives on Park Avenue. He has a car that I think he can live in part of the time, but he's always sort of in danger of that getting taken away. And homelessness is something that really affects me. And I, it just, it really just tugs at my heart. So yeah, if you feel like doing that, feel free. So the TLDR is this chick, Sarma Meningitis, whatever her name is. She was this like vegan it girl. I know, right? There's such a thing as a vegan it girl. What a time to be alive. She was a very successful restaurateur, opened this restaurant, which was like the vegan hotspot, the vegan raw hotspot. She was on the cover of magazines. There were all these celebrities that went there. And then she got ensnared with this absolute bag of hot garbage, this fat piece of shit who conned her, according to her, con he conned her. We're going to get back to that. 
took millions and millions of dollars from her, which she willingly gave to him, like married her and destroyed her business from the inside out to the point that her employees weren't getting paid. They go on the run and they both ended up in prison. Not for a long time. She did like four months. He did a year. It was a horse shit, you know? And I think a good lesson to take away is like we see con artists and we always think like, well, someday like they're going to, the cops are going to catch them and do what? Lock them up for four months? Could you do four months in Rikers for $2 million? I could. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? With, <sighs> this is the thing with con artists. And this is why I like to talk about them because publicity kills a con artist. Now, obviously they have publicity. I'm not really doing anything novel here, but we have an obligation to ourselves and the rest of society to stand up and say, hey, this person is a, is a fraudster. This person is defrauding people. And we don't because we're taught that it's humiliating and embarrassing. And you watch this show and you're like, this chick should be humiliated and embarrassing. It is both of those things. What on earth was she thinking? Dude. I mean, okay, I can tell I can tell you what she was thinking. All right. First, I want to point out a few red flags. So they met on Twitter because he was tweeting Alec Baldwin, like a weird stalker fanboy. And she's like, yeah, they were friends. No, he was tweeting and stalking Alec Baldwin. It's not, okay. But his Twitter handle was, you know you want it. I don't know if you were very young in like 2005, 2010, whenever this was, I will assure you this was just as cringe back then as it is now. Like there's no sort of cultural context that would make that like really funny or cool. It is not. It was stupid then. It's stupid now. Stupid. Also stupid. All this guy did was take selfies. If you get nothing else out of this video, it should be never date a man who takes selfies. And I don't mean like a selfies with his buddies on the golf course. Fine. Fine. A selfie just of himself, a selfie with wraparound sunglasses from the fucking gas station with his lips pursed. And there's many of these, there's more than one and it's not a joke. Clip it, clip it. This is all the data you need about somebody. I mean, it honestly is. Social media is for women. Selfies are for women. Influencerness is for women. When I see guys doing this, it, my skin crawls. I want to just sew my genitals shut and never use them again. It's so odious and such a turnoff. I don't understand. I don't understand how not, how, how apparently not everyone agrees with this. It's, it's like wild to me. Okay. So he lived in Boston when they met. She lived in New York City. It's a five hour train ride. It's a one hour flight. But despite talking for months, she said it took a while for us to meet. I was like, okay, that's red flag number three. We've got the selfies, we've got the username, okay. Why would it take you months to meet someone who lives a few hours away? I mean, they could be there later today. So that's also a red flag. Oh, but you know what he's on? Because he's in the CIA, he's Shadow Ops. Oh, Blackwater, Navy Seal. What is it with con men and that particular type of lie? So many con men not only default to the stolen valor, which... I mean, it could scratch someone's fucking eyes out if they pretend to be military cop. I, there's nothing more disgusting than stolen valor. But so many con men do that. And not just, oh, I'm in the military. Yeah, I'm a staff sergeant. Great. I, you know, I'm a, in the cavalry tank division. Amazing. 82nd Airborne. Cool. No, it's like I'm in the CIA and it's all very shadowy and, uh, and black ops and I can't tell you where I'm going. Okay. I actually know a lot of people who have like, shadowy black ops type jobs it's the last thing they bring up they don't talk about it to bartenders it's not on their twitter bio they don't re i mean if that is truly how they're moving they're like oh I'm a, I'm a travel nurse internationally really where's the last place you went qatar huh i know travel nurses they go to san francisco but these dudes it's like that's their that's their wheelhouse because it's this constantly shape-shifting thing that like, well, that explains why I didn't answer your phone call. That explains this and that. You know, it's just this wonderful card to play all the time. And you know what? I know a lot of cops because my friends work in law enforcement in New York City. Cops cheat. They cheat a lot on their wives. I mean, because their schedule is so malleable and like kind of shadowy. It's like, babe, I got to go. I don't know. We got to stay out like blah, blah, blah. 
So be aware of this. If some guy is presenting himself as a shadowy government agent, why the fuck would he be telling you? He, if that's true, if it is true that he's a shadowy operative, some chick he's met on Tinder and he's telling her, he's bad at that. Like kind of the hallmark of this is in the shadows. You gotta kind of keep a good secret. You shouldn't be telling every chick you meet on Hinge, oh, I'm actually in Blackwater and I have a secret thing that I have to go do. You're gonna get fired. So red flag. But this is an excellent strategy to deploy because it also gives you this enemies. My enemies, we heard this in the Tinder swindler, right? My enemies are after me, my enemies. And it's always like, well, who are your enemies? What are you talking about? There's people. If I have enemies, I know exactly who they are. Like I know exactly, if it's to the point where I am running from place to place from them, I'm not just like, gee, I, I don't know. They're just those people. No, I've got kind of a good grip on who it is. So finally they meet and she admits that he was quite fat. Like he looked good. He looked like any dude from like Southie Boston to me, like any guy you could find outside of Dunkin' Donuts, right? And she's like, you know, he was quite a bit heavier than um, I thought he was going to be. And here's something interesting she said. I didn't want to be judgmental about that, though, because I was looking for this big guy to protect me. And I mean, he was big, but I really didn't want to be judgmental about his body. Hold on. We're going to come back to the protection thing. That's cowboy. Can you just relax? You have no place to be. Your schedule is wide open today. I love you. Just everything is such a hardship for him. We're going to come back to the protection thing. On one hand, you think, yeah. We shouldn't be judgmental about a guy's body. And on the other hand, yes, we should. First of all, it's not about his body. It's about the lies. That's that's why you should be judgmental about his body. If you're talking to someone and they show up looking wildly different than how they present themselves. I don't care if that's they actually have no hair and you got hat fished, as I call it with all their pictures on Tinder had a hat on. It's like, oh, actually it's because you're bald. Great. Or they're four inches shorter or they're 75 pounds heavier. There is a perfect fit for someone bald, short, and fat, but there's not a perfect fit in my life for a liar. And I might've been totally gang to get to know this person if they had presented themselves honestly, but I'm actually not down to get to know someone who lies because I now know at this point in my life, lies are like cockroaches. For one that you see, there's a million you don't. No one lies about just one thing. No one. And I have been in a relationship where I was dating someone who lied about small things all the time. And I told myself and I told my friends, it's okay because he, I know at least he doesn't lie about the big things. Fucking wrong. He went to Africa with another woman. Okay. He lied about everything as it turns out. So don't tell yourself that lies are compartmentalized and encapsulated solely in the category in which you find them. They are not. It is a diffuse cancer that infects that person, your relationship, everything. But let's talk about the protection thing. Because remember when I said there was a specific set of circumstances that led her to this person that made her so incredibly easy to manipulate and such a beautiful, beautiful target for someone that toxic. Sarma said she had this need for protection. She was talking about what was going on in her life at the time, right? She had broken up with that other um, restaurant dude, who cares? She, she'd never experienced heartbreak like that. She had adopted her dog, Leon, who she was like obsessed with. I can relate, even though you're bothering me right now. She, she said, I was getting older. You know, she was in a lot of debt. Because opening this restaurant, you know, she had to have investors and pay people back. And she was, she was feeling, oh, cowboy. Huh? Is that mom? I was just going to text you. Oh, I was getting worried. I didn't know where he was. Oh. And the garage door was open. And oh, I no. She couldn't have been in there while she's. Oh, there. yeah. He was, he was asleep. So I was like, okay. Mom came and got the dog. Thanks. So she had this emotional wound, right? And what is the art of seduction? What's the root of seduction? Finding someone's wound and pressing. Not just pressing. You press on that wound to dial up how much it hurts, but then you say, oh my God, what is this? The antidote? <gasps> oh, only I hold the keys to this. Only I can make you feel better. This dude did exactly that. He positioned himself as very rich, protective. 
He would say things like, I love your dog as much as you do. First of all, that hit me some type of way. Because if a guy said that to me, I would, I would be very turned off. Like, you better not love my dog the way I do. He's mine. Like, I don't know. To me, that's like a very weird encroachment on territory. And, and like, also you don't. Like, fuck you. Like, he's my dog. Don't act like this is a joint project. He belongs to me. He will never be yours. We will never split time. He is my son, not yours. Like, love him, but stay in your lane. I prefer my dog to most men I meet. And so he drew, created this perfect, what we call the police sketch of who she wanted in her life. Now, we also need to talk about something. Something that I think this documentary really missed. An opportunity that they really missed. And you only really hear this at the end. And it was almost just kind of like slipped in there. Like, oh yeah, she admitted to me, like one of our friends said, like she never, ma she married him not because she loved him, but it was like a business arrangement because he had a lot of money and he was going to pull her out of debt. So it's kind of like she was trying to con him, but he conned her back and harder. Wait a minute. This throws the entire saga into a completely different light. And yet... I'm willing to bet if you're being honest with yourself and if I'm being honest with myself, we've done the same thing. I know what you're thinking. Uh, I've actually never conned someone out of money. No, but I bet you've used someone. I have. Picture this. You get dumped by someone you love or a fuck boy who just isn't into you. And there's this guy, let's call him Fat Louie because that's what I picture. And he's always been waiting in the wings and he's like, looking at you with these adoring eyes and you're thinking, <sighs> okay, yeah, I'll give him a chance because I think this dumpy dude is going to worship me. He has something that I want and I'm going to use him for that. What am I giving to him? Just the present, just me. He's allowed to look at me and touch me with those fat sausage fingers and I'm in a bad place emotionally. So I'm going to go for the ugly guy, the dumpy guy. And then what happens? Kill the cheerleader. We talk about this before. We talked about this in videos about like Ed Sheeran, Post Malone, because these dudes are like ugly, but annihilate women. Ed Sheeran has fucked the entire Victoria's Secret model starting lineup. He has, and he has negged them all. And they're like, I'm so sorry, what? But he's smart. He played it so that when they were in a vulnerable place and he met them through Taylor Swift when he was touring with her, and she was like very much in that group at the time, they were in a bad place and he's like, oh, I'll sing you my stupid songs and I'll look at you with my googly eye and I'm redheaded and talk to you in my accent. And they're like, oh, this guy is so far beneath me. He's going to worship me. And he negged them and they couldn't get over it. Not because their heart was so involved. No, it was their ego. The same bad thing that led them down that path to begin with spelled doom. Because what a guy like that is always going to do is fuck the hot chick, kill the cheerleader. Guys who are unattractive, dorky, nerdy, whatever it might be, they have this like, this like tick to get revenge on the hot chick from high school as he sees her in replicate throughout life, right? Whenever he encounters that hot chick, that cheerleader, even though the cheerleader's like, I like you, I want to be with you, he can't not neg her. He can't not. It's revenge for middle school. It's revenge for high school. That's what this was on a grand, expensive, criminal, catastrophic scale. It was kill the cheerleader. Only this dude, Shane slash Anthony, of course his name was Anthony, he's just a fat fuck, right? And yeah, I'm gonna keep going in on his body because like I said, um, guys, actually maybe I didn't say this, but I'm gonna say it now. Guys need to look good, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you don't go through menopause, your period, you don't get pregnant, you don't have kids, whatever. You need to do 50 push-ups a day, 50 sit-ups, 50 squats. That's what you need to do, bruv. I can handle it if you lose your hair. You can't control that. You can control your body. I don't date fat dudes. I don't date dudes who are out of shape. I don't. I'm sorry. Tough shit. I'm, you should be body positive. I am about women's bodies, not men. You have enough positivity out there. You've gotten to run the world for the last, I don't know, 10,000 years. Do some sit-ups. Not here for it. Thanks. What were we talking about? Oh, so part of what was at play was kill the cheerleader. But part of that, when we encounter kill kill the cheerleader, it's just desserts. It's what we deserve for using someone. Only it's like they played us right back. They used us right back. 
fuck. And on some level, we know that. That's why we get so twisted about it. Because we know, girl, you shouldn't have been messing with Fat Louie to begin with. You should have been messing with con man, Anthony. You should have been dating on your level. Or if you weren't at the place to find someone and connect with someone on your level and be real in a relationship, you need to take yourself out of the game and work on yourself. You didn't. You were looking for the easy workaround and it came back to bite you. Hate the game, not the player. That's what I got out of this documentary. <laughs> she was looking to con some, some dumpy fat dude out of money because she was so pretty and so wonderful. Yikes. Blew up in your face. So I feel sorry for her because she got played so hard. But had she been doing what she should have been doing, therapy, being alone, taking some time, this she wouldn't have been so susceptible to this guy. He wouldn't have been susceptible to her. None of this would have happened. By the way, what do you guys think of her just as a person? She seems like such a sourpuss, like a depressive. Did you notice in all the photos that they showed of her from when she was a kid to when she was like with celebrities, magazine covers alone in Italy, not one smile. I think I saw like literally one photo where she was smiling. It was always this, this sullen, big eyed, you know, she's talking about her childhood. I never really felt like I fit in. Well, you had a blue mohawk in high school. So yeah, I'm sure that didn't help you fit in. And also what adolescent feels like they do fit in? Can you show me the adolescent who's like, oh, <sighs> I always felt like I belonged. I don't care if you're a prom queen. I, I was prom queen. I never felt like that. You know, it's just so funny when people say things like that and then they use that as gasoline to fuel their bullshit mobile through life. Well, I just, I never felt like I belonged. Okay, well, you were doing things to deliberately not belong. And also you think you're so special. You've like canonized this suffering that is literally the suffering of everyone. It's not special. But, you know, she's like, I used it to do something different. I wanted to start this vegan empire. Great, good for you. That's cool. Until it wasn't. So this dude got his claws into her pretty, pretty easily. And he did so again by creating this police sketch of who she needed. Protective, like kind of dangerous, you know. And for a woman who is on her own, building her business, no one to help her, feeling her way, I get that. I get that. Like she brought up protection a lot. Like that seemed to like come out of her mouth a lot in this documentary. I totally get that. I live in Montana for God's sakes. There was a reason I was very drawn to that place with big men and big trucks and big guns because I want to be protected too. There's a Kenny Chesney song and I talk about it all the time. It's called The Woman With You. And it's from the point of view of a woman who's like gopher and chauffeur and copy repairman. You know, like I'm the CEO, I'm the this, I'm the that. I just want to be the woman. <laughs> I just want to be the woman with you. I just want to lay my head on someone's chest and have someone say, baby, I'm going to protect you. It's all going to be okay. <sighs> okay, thank you. But this is an emotional getaway car situation. What do we say about those? When you're in a, a situation where you need a getaway car, you committed a crime, you're doing something, there's danger. Are you particular about what make and model that car is? No. You're drowning in the ocean. Someone throws you a life raft. This doesn't match my suit. Can you get a new one? No. Someone just saved me. And when we're desperate, we do desperate things. And maybe something like that for her translated to, I'm going to con this man. He's going to worship me. He's going to pay my debts. He says he's going to protect me. What a fucking rube. I got him. No, baby girl, he got you back. Again, this is a cautionary tale on why we cannot date like that. We can't be users. We can't take advantage of people. And you know I love to manipulate others. I do. I don't date guys who are poor. I don't date guys who are fat or poor. Sorry. That's a great fit for someone out there. It's not a good fit for me. And it's not because I need someone to pay my bills. I don't. I want someone who has the ability, not because I'm ever going to need them to, but because that shows me they're operating at the same level I am. Okay, good. You got the same amount in the bank that I do. More? Great. You should. You're a white man in America. You should be making more money than me. There's nothing in your way. There's nothing holding you back. No glass ceiling. No low expectations. Nothing. Nothing. You fuck with me, you better be rich. Sorry, not sorry. Have the dumpies and the uglies and the pores and the fatties for somebody else. Not for us here on this channel. Sarma didn't think that way though. I mean, she did. 
but it wasn't, oh, are you on my level? It's what can you save me from? What can you do for me? And it backfired in a big way. And it's interesting how something like this backfires because like Tinder swindler, you know, we see these women and they were so bamboozled by the private jets and the, I felt like a princess. I felt like a princess, whatever their Norwegian accent was. I felt like a princess. Was it like that? I don't know. Here you go, here you go, here you go. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Shelling your raisins. <laughs> okay. They were bamboozled and taken in by this idea that he's going to save me. He's going to save me, right? And just like Sarma meningitis, it was reversed. It was an Uno reverse card. Suddenly, these women were taking care of these guys. Suddenly, the card that these dudes were playing in the beginning, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm shadowy. You know, I'm dangerous. I know all these dangerous people. It spun on its head and I need you to take care of me because I'm in the shadows and I'm in danger and I know all these shadowy people. <sighs> well played, my guys. Well played. I mean, that's... I was trying to think about how how a woman would have that kind of reversal. Like when you think what bamboozles a man, like a sex, you know, like that's the easiest one. Like the Megan Fox, it's like, I'm so sexy, I'm so sexy. How would she reverse it? I don't know. So that she, I don't know. Like, is it with the holding, withholding set? I don't think so. I don't think that there's a direct, um, a one-to-one -one with women on this. Maybe there is. Tell me, tell me in the comments if you, if you can think of one. I feel like there might be, and I'm, my brain's just like not pulling it, but it was fascinating to me how these dudes weaponized exactly what these women were hoping to get from these men against them. Again, that's a great lesson there. I remember in RTC them teaching us never carry a weapon that can be turned against you. If you aren't a hundred percent certain that you have control of that knife and no one's going to get from you, don't carry a knife. Same with like pepper spray. If you don't have a good grip, boop, it's out and then it's in your eyes. Okay. That's why I prefer guns. Like if you're advancing at me, I've got a pretty good lead time to shoot you and kill you before you're going to get that gun away. Knife, you got to get, anyway, it's the same thing emotionally. This, this weapon, this thing can be worked against you. So if you aren't a hundred percent certain that there's no possible way this dude could reverse, turn the tables, don't employ that. Don't go down that route. And you probably think, well, I wouldn't. Like, I know how to con a guy. If you're in the position where you're trying to con a man for money or get taken care of, you're in a position of weakness. You're not dating from a place of strength. And baby girl, I've got news for you. You are the easiest to manipulate. They can see you coming a mile away. So you think you've got this whole plan to wheedle him out of money? Mm -mm. You get caught up with a con man, a Splenda daddy, not a sugar daddy, a Splenda daddy. You're not getting a Chanel bag. You're getting brightened. Yeah, exactly. So be very, very aware of entering this kind of dynamic. The other thing that stood out to me in this, and it's so funny, I called this Will. You know, like the guy who was like the Irish guy who was reading like, oh, and this is what I was texting her back. I called it because I'm like, I bet Will, I, I would assume Will is him. And turns out it was like Will didn't actually exist. I'm sorry if I spoiled that for you, but I told you there were going to be spoilers. So this is something, and we talked about this in the follow-up to the Trend 45 video that I did about how to spot a con man. <laughs> As you know, my fan trips are no longer with Trend, they're with Trova Trip, and they're a great corporate company completely squared away, tons of legal documents that we all sign. That's what you want, accountability. You want that. Anyway, we talked about something called cooling the target, and shout out to my friend Lizzie for telling me about this. Cooling the target means... There's someone working with your con man, either on purpose or most effectively not on purpose, I'll tell you that in a sec, to cool you down, the target, cool you down when you're getting a little too close to the truth, a little too fed up, a little too where the fuck is my money, a little too fed up. They're going to come in and be like, hey, hey, he's, he's on the shadowy mission to restore freedom and um, in these in these places and in overthrowing a dictatorship. There's someone who's going to come in and feed you the lies that you need to hear in order to stay on the hook. Now, what do I mean maybe unintentionally? Well, I talked about this in a video. The person who cooled the target when I was entangled with my last fuck boy was his sister. She 
was like, Shallon, Tom loves you. He's obsessed with you. He's just in a bad place and he's dealing with this and da 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 she wasn't doing this because he told her to. She genuinely believed that. And that's why she sold it so well, because it wasn't a lie. Like, she believed this. And I, of course, wanted to believe this. I didn't want to believe that all this time and emotion I had sunk into this hot sack of emotional garbage was fruitless. It was the sunk cost bias, which is like, we're going to we're going to throw more money after something to try to recoup our investment rather than just cutting our losses. And it's very foolish to do that. And we all, we have all done that emotionally, financially, sexually. Well, I just have to keep fucking him so he knows how good I am in bed. Because if I don't remind him with nightly blowjobs, um, how is he ever going to love me? Mm. Imagine those blowjobs were checks. Would you write a $100 check to that dude every time he sucked his dick? If the answer is yes, we better talk. Okay. But yeah. She was cooling the target and keeping me on the hook in a very organic way. So Anthony, Fat Anthony in this, used this Will person. It was like, oh, he works for the government. And I'm, I am I was watching with my mom. I'm like, does this bitch think that every like government, like military wife has their own personal concierge from within the government to just like talk them through things? Had, did it ever occur to her to like ask like, join a CIA wives Facebook group and be like, does any of this make sense to you guys? Like a military, just a military wives Facebook group. Ever occur to her to call Langley? Does this person work for you? No. And she was given plenty of data that he was full of shit, like his mugshot with a completely different name. And she was explaining it away to her employees. Now, this is where I think it's very reasonable to say she was fully in on this. Like, she wasn't a victim. She was a co-conspirator. She was a perpetrator. Perhaps she started out as a victim. Maybe, maybe she started out as someone trying to con him and it was like, hey, if you can't beat him, join him. By the way, okay, you know that guy Nazim, I think his name was? He's like this Russian, like I believe that dude was black ops. He sits down, he's like, I'm from Russia. I was a bartender. I got involved with Anthony. I think he was a prostitute, like a male prostitute. And Anthony was like, bro, Stop fucking with these society wives getting 150 bucks here, 300 bucks there. You need one big fish and I'm going to show you how to do it. Sit back, watch how I wheedle this Sarma chick, my wife. You just got to find one rich bitch who's a little weak, marry her, bleed her dry. That's how you got to do it. Look at you, bro. You're hot. I'm dumpy. I did it. You can do it. I bet you that's what was going on. I bet you. Oh no, we were friends. I was investing. Horseshit. Horseshit, dude. I don't believe that for a second. So eventually these two go on the run after her employees stage multiple walkouts because they're not getting paid. And again, like the rhetoric she was she was employing on her employees about why they weren't getting paid was the same rhetoric her husband, Fat Anthony, was giving her about why she wasn't getting her money back. And we could say, well, hurt people hurt people or well, he was coaching her what to say. Or if you're a bit less optimistic, you could say, no, they're just cut from the same cloth. She's a con artist too. He just conned her bigger and better and harder. That's capitalism, baby. Welcome to America. Speaking of that accent, how bad do you want to visit Pigeon Forge, Tennessee right now? That place looks fantastic. Oh, it's a bird in my window. Hi. Oh, goodbye. How bad do you want to visit? Dollywood? <sighs> I want to go my whole life. Have you been to Dollywood? If you've been to Dollywood, tell me what it's like in the comments. I need to know. The Titanic thing? I'm... Can we go? Oh my God, it looks amazing. But she finally gets arrested down there. And you know your life has taken a wrong turn when a multiple convict lady in Tennessee is like, why'd you make those choices, girl? Why'd you, why'd you do that? When your celly in the Tennessee jail is like, you're living wrong, honey. I just, I don't know, man. <laughs> when Crystal is like, you ain't living right. I think you need Jesus. Just, I know I've done been in here five times, but shit, I never done what you did. Fuck, man. Okay. I mean, if that's not a wake up call, I just don't know what is. She seemed really nice though. I mean, if I had to be in prison with anyone, probably her. So some other things that were red flags to me in this that told me Sarma is just as guilty. Oh, my mom pointed out she's got to tell when... 
producers started asking her things that she kind of didn't want to answer that she was like maybe complicit in or she wasn't quite as innocent as she seemed or she was just getting annoyed she scratched her jaw there's a ton of tells when people are lying or talking about things they don't want to for men it's a lot of times they they rub the back of their neck I don't know why the neck in particular like the back neck. I would think the front of the neck since it's like a your underbelly you know you're trying to guard your underbelly people touch their mouths because they're literally they're trying to keep the the lie in you know they they touch their hair they touch themselves because they're trying to create this barrier between you and the lie and themselves so she would touch her jaw like literally trying to keep her mouth shut when she was lying or being duplicitous very very interesting so if you're going back and re-watching it check that out she also said things like because fat anthony conned her own mother out of four hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars. her poor dad professor at mit he's like what is this band of idiots i've surrounded myself with you know sarma was like i you know my mother's so poor now and i feel like it's my fault it is your fault you feel like it you feel i feel like it i i feel like it's my fault Cowboy doesn't know how to speak English. It is 100% your fault your mom is broke. 100%. So again, it's that I'm sort of taking responsibility. S sort of. Eh. Eh. But not really. And she would couch things in like he was going to make my dog immortal. I get that you love your dog. Part of dog ownership is knowing you're going to outlive them. And it's awful. It is unfair and unbearable and that is just the way that it is that's just the way that it is part of being born and being a human you're gonna outlive your parents and it's also awful <sighs> immortal i don't know i almost think her and anthony came up with this like celestial gobbledygook that they did together as like a story to explain why they're just fucking grifters do you know what i mean like hey we're gonna tell everyone that i told you you were gonna ascend this spaceship where dogs live forever blah, 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 whatever the fuck it was because he talked endlessly and said almost nothing there's like not a single noun or verb in anything that he says it's bananas but it's gonna be so fantastical and so bizarre Everyone will think, Sarma, everyone will just think you're stupid. They'll think you're stupid, but they won't think you're a criminal. And you can recover from stupid. You can't recover from being a criminal. And sh maybe she was like, okay, yeah, that's great. We're going to act like I just got taken into a cult because everyone feels sorry for someone in a cult. Look at Scientologists. Oh, that's, so, that's too bad. I don't know, man. Because at the very end of this documentary, the thing that clinched it all for me that Sarma knew Sarma is not really a victim here. Their very last phone call recorded in 2019, their very last call, jovial, jokey. You're going to have to, sh to shape shift from a meat suit to a unicorn. <laughs> Are you going to do that? <laughs> mm -mm. She knew. That's not how I would speak to someone who, let's first and foremost, bankrupted my mother. There's no coming back from that. There's no coming back. There's, I wouldn't even be speaking to you because you would be dead. I would easily kill someone who fucked with my mom. And I do 10 years with a smile on my face. I wouldn't care. I got time. The last thing I do. <laughs> Are you going to be a unicorn? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'll talk to you later. You fucking liar. You're a liar, Sarma. No. So no, as this went on, I felt less and less sorry for her. I started maybe feeling a little sorry for her. Hey, you know, I know what it's like to be a businesswoman and feel alone in the world and just want someone to take care of you. Not financially. I don't need that, but just emotionally. I get it. I get that. I don't get how, no, I don't get the rest of this. So what can we learn? Well, like we were saying, you date from a place of weakness, weak things become targets. If you're not prey, you're predator. Prey doesn't mean you're taking advantage of other people. It means you're moving through this world not afraid of anything. Not afraid of getting left. Not afraid of rejection. Not afraid of being by yourself. Not afraid of putting yourself out there. You're an apex. Nothing is fucking hunting you in a bad way. If you're not that, you're on the other side. And there's always going to be a predator out there who isn't quite as sweet as we are, who is looking to take advantage of someone who's weak and vulnerable. It's so easy. It's so embarrassingly easy. 
But some of you guys wanted to talk about money management. What always blows me away is women giving money to men. I have told you guys before, I have issues with talking about money and value myself because, and hopefully this will illuminate something for some of you guys. And every time I share it, there's always like one of you who's like, oh my God, that was a light bulb moment for me when you said that. So I have a real issue with money because my father never paid child support to my mother, like not one dime. And so therefore my dollar value as a human is zero. I, have, I am a zero dollar value person, right? So that has worked very steadily against me uh, in business. I don't ask for raises. Me, you know, the things that I sell, it is agony for me to price them. And I have, I have to have somebody else do it because I'm like, I don't know what this is worth. It's worth nothing. And they're like, it is though. I'm like, I, pfft. it's something I'm trying to get better at. Um, financially, just in terms of spending, I feel more comfortable, like not, com not happy, but more, it feels more familiar in those toxic patterns. If I'm a little bit broke, because that's just more familiar to me because I should be broke because I have zero value. So why wouldn't I be? It's rough. I say this because the only upside of this is I will not give anyone money. I won't even talk about money with someone I date because it's such a weird, sensitive, triggery topic for me. If they bring it up, I'm like so over triggered. I'm so creeped out. I can't handle it. I get so awkward. I'm done with them. I'm done with them. Now, this is, of course, worked against me in healthy relationships when you do need to talk about money. I've learned to do it in a healthier way. But if someone's like, I've, I have guys who I go out with that I meet on Tinder and they're like, you're a YouTuber. How much money do you make? And I'm like, how big is your dick? Like, well, no, I'm just, I'm just, you know, wanting to know. I too am wanting to know. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how much money do you make? It's like, it's a very uncomfortable topic. I never speak to them again. And if a guy would ever ask me for money, I was dating someone for years. And he called me with this bizarre story. Someone broke into my hotel and he was in like Paris or something. And, 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 my, and my wallet's gone. And, and I, I don't know. It was like, I need your help. Enemies. People are after me. The story, it was like a dream. It, it made no sense. It was not linear. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, I, I, I need money. And I said, no, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, but no, no. And we'd been together for years. I said, no, I'm, mm -mm. you're going to have to call your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sister. I, no, not me. I'm, mm -mm. I didn't at the time have money to give him, but if I did, uh, uh, and that was the beginning of the end. And I'm glad for that complex I have because it, when I see a guy do that, it's like, oh, oh, hell no. There's something really, really wrong here. So I want you to take that energy. Don't take my complexes, but I want you to take the upside of that. Men never should ask a woman for money. Well, Shallon, people go through things. No. What are men hardwired to do? We're on like a DNA caveman level. Protect, provide, produce. That's their role. They kill the woolly mammoth. They fucking make the babies. They build the fire. They do these things. That's what they do. Okay? So when you have a man bucking DNA itself, nature herself, and needing a woman to come rescue them, what kind of caveman would that have been? Not one who was part of the tribe for very much longer. Out you go, bud. Now, the counter argument to this is, okay, well, Shallon, then you were hardwired to birth and you're not having kids. So how can you expect a man to fulfill his genetic destiny when you're not doing yours? Okay, I get that. Um, my counter to, to that counter is I am providing the same amount of nurturing that I would give to a baby, but to a man. A baby is a diversion. That's diverting my energy, my time, my resources. Yeah, your heart expands. Oh, we have so much love. You, you might have a ton of love. You don't have a ton of money and a ton of time. Like that, those are static figures, right? So all the attention that I would give to a baby, I'm plugging into my husband, to my boyfriend, to my partner. 
So I am fulfilling my destiny without having to birth anything out. I am just as nurturing and just as loving, but for this dude right here. So yeah, I expect him to fulfill his destiny because I'm fulfilling mine to his direct benefit. I don't have a baby. And I'm like, who the hell are you? You know, I'm not pregnant and not wanting to fuck anymore. I'm still super into you, bud. So you better be into me. We both have our roles. We have our lanes. So you better not ask me for money because guess what I'm not going to ask you for? Birthing out a child. I'm not going to make you wear heels to dinner. I'm not going to fuck you in the ass. Like, what are you taking off my plate now that I'm daddy? Since I'm providing and I'm bailing you out, what exactly is your benefit here? And of course, we don't want to be users and, and have that sort of usury relationship with relationships. But we also got to keep it 100 and be like, if you're not making my life better, you're making it worse. There is no actual neutrality. Nothing is neutral. There is no net zero ever when it comes to friendships, possessions. If I don't use something, then it's actually a net loss. It's taking up room in my life. It's junk. It's clutter. Food. There's nothing you can eat that has no effect on your body. What would that be? Even water. That's a benefit. So relationships. Clearly, something as complicated and dynamic in two-party system as a relationship obviously is going to have a benefit or a detraction. And when the pendulum swings, and for me, money is how that happens in some circumstances, bye. I thank God for my complexes because it makes me so creeped out. Never give a man money. He should not want that from you, ever. And while I like a man who can provide, and I want a man who knows that, I would rather sleep on a park bench than ask a guy I know for money. Would never happen. Never. Never. Ever. I would take out a loan. I would <laughs> ask my mom. I would sell my stuff. I would sleep in my car. I would never ask someone I was dating. Ever. I don't lead with weakness, and that's weak. I don't have a panic attack and call someone I'm talking to. I, just, I don't do that. I solve my own problems. It doesn't mean I'm an island of a human and I don't need other people and I don't need love. It means that first and foremost, I fix things. My go-to when a problem arises, whether it's financial, emotional, is not who is going to fix this for me. It's how am I going to fix this for myself? Therefore, I'm a little bit more con artist proof. I'm a little bit more fuck boy proof. I'm a little bit more broken hearted proof. And I'm happy. I'm happy being single. I want a boyfriend. Yeah, of course. I don't need one. I want a man who could pay my bills. I don't need him to. I don't really want him to. But I want him to be doing well enough that that would even be possible. Great. That's a good metric for me. So don't date guys who take selfies. Don't date anyone who asks you for money. Ever. Don't have friends who ask you for money. I mean... I get maybe there's catastrophes here or there, but if that is if that is something they feel comfortable doing, that's the red flag. They should be ashamed. They should be appropriately ashamed. Because again, like they need to figure their own problems out. If they come to you hat in hand, hey, I really need your help. Okay, I understand that this is hard for you and I appreciate that this is hard for you. That tells me you see the value in being independent. You see the value in my money and my work ethic. And I believe you're going to pay me back. And I believe you're asking because you genuinely need it. Not because this is like fun. The way this dude asked her for money, it was expectation. It was demand. It was entitlement. No, no, no. And the way we clip a user, take away the, th the thing you think they're using you for. Whether it's your car, sex, empathy, a, a shoulder to cry on, take it away. How do they react? Are you the bad guy? What do we say? The people who hate your boundaries are the ones who benefited from you having none at all. And that doesn't change just because you refuse to see it. The writing is on, that writing is on the wall. It's always been there. Are you ah, refusing to read it? To your own peril, my darling. To your own doom. Learn from Sarma. The writing was on the wall. She didn't read it. And instead of becoming a victim, maybe there was a time where she was a victim, that victimhood very quickly slip slides into being a criminal yourself. I don't even mean that just literally. She is a literal criminal. But when we're dating someone who's cheating on us and we won't see it, 
are you really the victim? Yeah, he's cheating, but you're sticking around. You're making excuses for him. He's not even making them for himself. And when things finally, finally do implode and it's over, yeah, you're going to be mad at him. You're going to be a lot more mad at yourself. I know because I've been there and it's awful. There's nothing like being mad at yourself. That's when you really can't move on. That's when you get stuck and twisted. Not when you're mad at someone else, but when you say to yourself, when you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, no, the writing was on the wall. I chose not to read it. That wasn't anyone else's fault. In fact, other people were reading it and reading it back to me. And I, I didn't want to hear it. I was vilifying them. They were the problem. Turns out I was the problem. Isn't that what we're all afraid of? That we're the common denominator and all our bad outcomes and we're actually the problem? That's a nightmare. So avoid that. Read the writing. Be okay to walk away. Practice saying no. Not just when someone asks you for $1.7 million, but when someone asks you to do something you just don't want to do. You don't, it doesn't have to be mean or because you don't trust them or because they're bad. You just might not be into going to the movies that night, driving up to Calabasas, whatever it might be. Practice those micro boundaries. And then when it comes time to have the big boundaries, no sweat, baby. I want to know what you guys have to say. Tell me everything. Like I said, join me in Italy. And we're still doing the trip to Mexico, of course. So if you want something a little beachy, feel free to come to that. The links are down below. And if you want to give Anthony a helping hand, a few bucks, that would probably be really sweet. You know, I whatever you guys feel comfortable with. You know, we like to help everybody around here. We're going to see you next time, Shalligators. I am going to take a little bit of a break, like I said, because I'm going back to Montana. So I'm going to take maybe the next week off. Unless, of course, something amazing happens and, you know, I got you. But... I'll see you on the flip side. I shall see you.